So good morning. My name is Chad White, um, otherwise known as Chad at Fox Hall. Um, so the way I give my classes, I want to be very casual with it. Um, and so if you have questions, you want to speak up. Uh, I've already given Ursula permission to yell at me if I um, start going too fast. So, um, and, and, and Ursula, that is yelling at me because I can't really see anything with my screen being full screen. So, because um, I do get excited and I talk really, really fast sometimes. Um, so I'm hoping this will take about 20, 25 minutes to get through the slides, presentations. Chances are it probably won't because I'll go on and, on tangents and that's what I do. But this is about the Ivory Bengal Lady. Um, um, this is a paper I just did recently um, during my master's program uh, that kind of turned into a class. So we're dealing with um, elite burial and ethnic diversity in Northern England at the time of the Roman occupation towards the end of it. So uh, trigger warning. Uh, Kind of a little late for that because there are skeletal remains pictured in this presentation. Um, so that, that's my content or slash trigger warning for that. But what we're discussing today is, um, so uh, back in 1901, there was a grave discovered in construction outside of York, England. Uh, inside that grave, inside the stone sarcophagus was the remains of this uh, very wealthy young woman. Um, Sadly, uh, there were no drawings or pictures taken of her grave when it was discovered. Um, so we don't know quite all the details that a, a modern archeologist would love to know. Um, but we, we do have remains, her remains are currently in the Yorkshire Museum right now, um, along with the grave goods she was buried with. Um, basically for a century after her discovery, she was just another woman, another grave, no, no one made a big deal about it. But it was about 2010 when people were uh, examining her, her grave under modern standards and new scientific discoveries and things like that, that you know, she kind of jumped out at them because what they discovered um, it, it, is she is actually of North African descent. So we are at the very top of the, the Roman Empire, as far north as you can go. And here's this extremely wealthy woman, not a slave, who is from probably as far, you know, almost as far down as the Roman Empire reaches, or at least has some kind of connection to that. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit today is how, um, what she was buried with, where her great goods, what it meant, how we can interpret this, um, because she also may have, been, may have been a Christian or may have been buried with Christian items or be buried by Christians. There's all different ways to interpret this. And uh, we have to understand that because there's no record, record that says here lies this person, she was so and so. We it, it, all, it, all, it is all based on interpretation. So, can I make the slides advance? Yes. Okay. Yay. So, um, Roman Empire about 400. So, what's happening in the Roman Empire around 400 is a lot of fighting. A lot of like there's multiple emperors standing up at the same time. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, so. Britain at the time is basically um, Emperor Honorus down the continent. People in Britain are like, hey, we need your help. And Honorus is like, nope, deal with it yourself. So, so about 409, 410 is what we consider to be the end of the Roman occupation. And we call it an occupation uh, because while there were 28 different cities and stuff in Britain at the time, the fact that the language didn't change to Latin like it did in France or Gaul and, and other places, we, we, it's interpreted mostly as the fact that at, because of that reason alone, the language issue, that it was more of an occupation than a settlement type thing. If it were a settlement and people were truly incorporated into the culture, we would expect the language to have changed a lot more than it did. So um, the fact that Anglo-Saxon will come over in the next 50 to 100 years and basically replace all of the local language families except for the Welsh, which get pushed off to the side, uh, and it's not Latin necessarily, this is an occupation. I hope that makes sense to what I would say. But way at the top you see, and the very top of the thing you see Hadrian's wall way up here. Um, so York is sitting just a little bit below that. So if you're unfamiliar with where York, England is, this is what Roman bread about 410 looked like at the time. This is how it's broken up in administrative sections. And Ibaracum or York is sitting right here. And if you see my cursor on the thing. So, um, and, and York was, basically a major settlement center, a major supply center, a major trading port um, um, from before this time, during this time and after this time, it, it remains so. Um, to me, it's kind of a fluke that York didn't replace London other than where London is located, but it, 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 I think it was an iffy, iffy thing at that point. So city of York, where York is located um, to place us in this is 
York is located on the complex of two rivers that goes out to the Humber, the Humber uh, you know, estuary uh, to access to the sea. So we have one river here, the River Foss. We have the River Ouse. O-U-S-E is Ouse, as an oozing. Um, and then the city itself is, lo is located kind of between these two rivers and on the banks of the other side of the rivers. The military fortification, the main fortification for the, for the Roman Empire, was between these two rivers and this nice big square where the York Minster or Cathedral now sits in the middle. Most of that wall still exists in some form or, or fashion. And then the York Wick or village, the settlement sits outside across the River Ouse from there. And my next slide kind of shows a recreation of what that would have looked like. So if you're sitting in, in York City Center or at the Minster, it's right here, right on top of the original military headquarters, the, the commander's location. So um, you go into the basement of, of York Cathedral, you can still see that now, the frescoes on the wall walking the Roman street. So um, York around 1900, what was happening is industrial revolution, population is booming, construction's going on. All this stuff is happening in the city. There's a lot of major stuff. And the fact that York has been continuously settled for over 2000 years, anywhere you dig a hole, they're gonna find stuff. So it wasn't a big surprise to find this grave. Roman cemeteries were located outside of the Roman city walls on the streets leading up to it. Our, our woman here, the Ivory Bangle Lady or IBL, um, the street she was buried next to, which is now a, 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 a urban center, kind of a, um, it's a row of houses, basically Edwardian era houses and, and stuff like that. Um, that was the street you would take to if you're going to London. So major road, major deal, lots of cemeteries there. Um, so that's where her cemetery was buried. Now in her grave were a number of items. There were uh, bangles made of jet, the black gemstone. There were bangles made of ivory. There were blue glass bead choker necklace. There were other blue glass beads. There were yellow glass earrings, a silver pendant, a hand mirror, a, a blue glass jug, and a, a bone plaque and carved in, in Latin. And what that Latin said was, Soro Ave Vitas and Deo, or Hail Sister, May You Live in God. And you can see the little plaque here, and we'll look at that a little bit more as well and what that actually means. So going item by item, what's in the grave and what this means. This is obviously an, a very elite burial. This is a woman with money who, and, and you know, who, who had wealth and had access to things. She was about, we think, 28 years old. So based on analysis of the grave. So she was a young woman um, in, in that sense. She may have been a mother by that point, probably was, we, we're not sure. But so Jet, um, at least in the time of the Roman Empire, is locally produced. Um, it's actually, uh, the stone itself is gathered in Whitby, which is north of York. Um, there actually is no, at the time of the Roman Empire, there's no evidence that Jet was actually manufactured or shaped or done anything in Whitby, but it was in York. So we think that they were actually bringing the jet material down to York, manufacturing the items there, and then it is actually being shipped over the entire Roman Empire. For in the, During the third century, it was actually a popular faddish item to have jet jewelry. This bracelet that you see on the, the screen was actually from her burial, one of the ones she wore. These other kind of intaglio style designs were things that were found over in Germany and, and in Gaul, made of the same material. So it was a popular item for a century or so. It, it, it's at its time, um, but she was wearing them and, and, uh, when she was buried. Uh, the other item uh, is the ivory bangles. And as Risa sent out, there was a number of ivory bangles. This is a piece of just one. They were delicately carved. They were intricate designs and they were made of African ivory um, uh, from, from either North Africa or possibly Southern Spain. Um, not entirely sure of where, exactly where those were, were from, um, but there are a number of them. So she would have had a number of bracelets, both in jet and ivory. So I want you to imagine you're wearing those. You, you've got black bracelets and you've got white bracelets on both arms mixing. That's going to make a pretty striking display, that alone, the black and white images, like that. Um, one of the things that's also not really talked about, it's kind of people are just kind of getting into it a little bit, is the idea that, you know, what is the sound these bracelets would have made when she was wearing? So you have to think about sound of clothing and sound of jewelry as well. You know, if she's walking into her house or into her room wearing these bracelets, they're going to clatter together. They're going to make noise. Um, and this is going to announce her presence. 
So, and, and it wasn't just the women that were doing uh, thinking of this, the men at the time where it was fashionable for men, both military and not military to wear these military style leather belts that had silver bells on them. So they were announcing their presence as well. So the, basically the louder and more annoying your presence can be, the wealthier you are, the more prestige you have, you're announcing your presence to that room. So, and, and this is something that was happening. So people don't think, think of like the sound of silk when it's rustling or, or something like that. These are sounds that matter to people and, and, and whether it was conscious or not, these were things that happened. Um, other things that were in her burial, um, the blue glass jug, um, it's a little like four inch jug. It's not very big. Um, probably perfume, you know, may have been anointing oil that was done at her graveside and left in her, in her grave. Uh, we, again, we don't know where in her grave this was. We don't know if it was in her hand, in a, bat, in a box, at her feet. We have no idea. Um, but we do know the blue glass jug came from Germany. So the same as the beads. Blue glass was being produced in Germany at the time by the, during the Roman Empire, and, and people were shipping this over. Um, at one point, it was assumed that this um, necklace may have been a bracelet. It's a little bit big for a bracelet. Now we think it's a choker necklace. Um, you can see on the picture here, the beads are some are mostly faceted, and there's some flat ones as well. So she would have wearing this blue choker necklace then as well. So now you've got the, the, the black and white bracelets. You've got the blue necklace. You've got the yellow earrings, you know, uh, uh, glass earrings on as well. So these are striking contrast and colors on this young woman. So, and it, it's showing her status and showing what, who she is. Um, one of the other, other items, last, one of the last things we talk about in here is the mirror. Um, it was, uh, it, I, I want to call it a common object for, for elite burials. There was this co small convex hand mirror, possibly may have been originally in a wooden case. The case does not remain, we don't know. Um, but why would someone like this be buried in? Either was this a woman of great beauty? Were they showing that she was of great beauty? Was this a treasured item that she had? You know, we have no idea of, of telling quite how old this item is, if it was in her lifetime or if it belonged to a mother, an aunt, a sister. We have, we have no idea exactly how age this is, so we have to interpret what this is. If someone is, is considered a great beauty and burying them with a mirror might have been a thing. We don't know. So but that's one of the other items that was, was in that grave. And so lastly, we have this plaque, and this is the remains of the, this, this uh, bone carved plaque. Um, so uh, a, a, as I said before, it, 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 it's Latin, and it's um, hail sister, may you live in God. Now this introduced an interesting element to us. Um, at the time, we knew that Christianity was a thing. Um, so we, we think she was buried between 350, 400. So right at the end of that Roman occupation, right as, as Rome was pulling out of Britain, which could be a high part of high point in, in York society because you have this wealthy burial of this young woman. So it's like this could have been a, a great time to live in York. But then at the same time, within that fifty year time period, Rome is like, screw it, you're on your own. But dealing with the idea of, of this plaque and what it means, so I think it was. Um, and feel free to correct me because I'm scanning through twenty two pages of notes. Um, <laughs> I think it was 313 was the Edict of Milan when the emperor said that Christianity can happen and people can be unmolested um, and, and practice their faith. But there's other than that, especially in Britain, there's not a lot of evidence of Christianity, physical evidence that we have of it. So, and, and this presents us a nice one. This, this shows us this. Um, yeah, 313, I found my notes the right thing. So um, after 313, 314, um, the emperor call, uh, has this big conference uh, of priests. And we know that at least three different bishops from three different major urban centers in Britain travel um, to the, the continent to attend this conference. Uh, actually, they, they call, sorry, uh, my notes are not highlighted here. The, the emperor, the, the, the bishop from York is actually called Eborus, which isn't really a name because it's Ibarakum. So, you know, basically one of the uh, theories that's been put forth is that because his name is derived directly from Ibarakum, that someone just didn't bother asking his name and just kind of filled it in later on with their copying down records. You know, some, some clerk is just like, well, he's from Ibarakum, Ibaros, that's fine. It'll, it'll, it'll be fine, it's good enough. But, you know, so it was the three major bishops, three major urban centers. And this tells us our interpretation of this is that there was a connected Christian community 
in Britain at the time uh, of this woman's burial at the time of 313 to 350 around that, that century, there was this connected community. So um, it doesn't necessarily say that this woman was Christian. You know, she may have been a practicing Christian in her lifetime. However, um, one of the couple things that, that kind of contradict this, but is actually being come in question lately, is the fact that her burial was in a north-south facing direction with her head towards the north. Now, Christians, if you're familiar with, with archaeology of this period, um, tend to be buried east-west, not north-south. So pagans tend to be north-south. Also, there's a question of all these grave goods. A lot of these goods are personal adornment. However, you have the question of the bottle and the plaque and a few other things that are happening. Um, we, the, the, you know, people ask if the plaque or, or if questions of the plaque may have been on a wooden coffin because she was found in a stone sarcophagus and those things that exist. However, there were no iron nails or iron remnants found, so we don't think there's a coffin. So it could have been on a, on a jewelry box or attached to some other item that has not survived uh, in, in the grave. You know, so it was attached to something we just don't know what. Um, but we, you know, we also might say that you know there's a Christian community in York, and she may have had Christian friends, and she may have been buried by a Christian. Um, one of the things that's always good to consider at these times is the fact that people don't bury themselves. So you know, it, it's always you know, it's other people who are burying them, uh, um, and, and, and they're expressing their wishes on this deceased person and, and how they're represented. Uh, and, and fashions affect this. And if there was a, a fashionable, wealthy person who is, happens to be Christian and, and, and cares for their friend, they might include this in that grave. So we don't know if she was Christian. We don't know if not. Now, it's previously been interpreted that grave goods are pagan. No grave goods are Christian. However, uh, a little more recently, in, in looking at some of the, the actual literature that's written, especially about 50 to 100 years after this in the Govian period, um, a lot of these prohibitions against grave goods weren't necessarily because grave goods bad, grave goods pagan. It's more about because people are gonna know there's grave goods and are gonna dig up the grave to go steal them because it's wealthy stuff and we need the body to be intact for the resurrection. So it, it's more about disturbing those remains to get to the money than it is about necessarily being buried with your, your, your precious objects. So, you know, to carry into the afterlife like we would think of today. So the other question, of course, that comes with Christianity is if you study this period um, from the end of the Roman occupation to the Anglo-Saxon period, we're, we're kind of taught that, you know, Christianity disappears from England um, between the period of when Rome leaves and when Bertha, Queen of Kent, comes up from Francia with her priests for the first time and reintroduces Christianity and Augustine sends off his missionaries to, to convert to the Anglo-Saxon pagans to Christianity. Um, however, we're only dealing with like a century of time. So you're, you're looking three, four generations. Christianity probably still existed in these communities in small, weird, disconnected pockets, um, but it's just not there. One of the reasons we have to interpret this grave so much is because there is almost a zero written record of what was happening in Britain between 300 and 450. It's like, no one's writing anything. So the, the, the next thing we get is from, is from Gildas, who writes after this period, and, and his description of the Anglo-Saxons coming, he calls it very unbiased on the ruin of Britain. You know, because all these, these Anglo-Saxon pagans have come over, and he talks about the Christians who are still there, who weren't doing the Christian thing and weren't fighting back. And so they deserve what they get, type of thing. So it's a very unbiased interpretation. I, I love reading Gildas. So it, it's great in that sense. So, um, but you know, in, uh, this is another Christian. I meant to talk, slow this slide during talk about the Christian community. So we've got our, our lovely Shero right there and, the, and this plaque of mosaics and stuff that's happening. Um, we talk about the human remains itself. So, um, we find it in my notes as I take a breath. Um, so they, they did a bone analysis on this and it's very controversial because the system they use is actually done by forensic anthropology um, and it's, it's called Fordisk. And I'll, I'll read to you from the paper itself, which I've uploaded the entire paper to the uh, Google share drive for the ROM. So if you're interested in it, all the sources are there as well, the entire paper, 21 pages of my ramblings. Um, 
So the University of Reading's Department of Archaeology analyzed her facial features, the chemical signature of the food she drank, uh, food and drink Holy she consumed. Shit. What? When you're reading, you speed up. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ursula. The University of Reading's Department of Archaeology analyzed her facial features, the chemical signature of her food and the drink she consumed, and the evidence from the burial site. The research concluded that this high status woman was partially of North African descent. Um, and this is the quotation from the search. The skull exhibited a low, wide, and broad nasal ridge with a wide interorbital breath suggested of, quote, black ancestry. While the nasal spine and nasal border demonstrated white characteristics, the shape and nasal aperture, um, the, the shape of the nasal aperture was inconclusive. Although some post-mortem damage had occurred, the cranium uh, was complete enough to perform a craniometric analysis, which quantifies the characters, characteristics of an objective scale and attempt to further define the ancestral identity of the individual. Ugh. Excuse me while I take a drink. Now, this method of measuring skull sounds a little, um, let's say, Nazi-ish. They're measuring skulls and things like that. Um, it's also controversial because the, the measurements these are based on are based off of human remains in the last century or so. So you know, the, the database they're using, it doesn't go back very far. And so they're applying this thing for uh, human remains that are 2000 years old. So there's a lot of controversy. Um, there was analysis done, like I said, on her teeth and, and, and her gums as, as well. And what they've determined is that she grew up on a coast and probably someplace warmer than York. Um, it could be as nearby as the southern coast of Britain, so, uh, or Gaul or, or, or Spain or somewhere along those lines. Um, they don't think at this time it's probably not, she's not actually born in North Africa. She may have been born for the, further north in, inside the uh, continent. But when this all came out in 2010, there was controversy, of course, because you have people claiming that there's a black woman in North Africa, in, in Northern England, um, which is entirely possible. However, there are a lot of people who don't like that idea. Um, but, you know, you're looking at what's going on in, in York at the time in the Roman Empire, people travel from all over. And it's not bizarre to think of this woman as being North African. So there are plenty of other African Romans that are accounted for, including uh, several uh, senators, or sorry, senators, emperors. Um, so Tibia Severus, um, who's in the center picture here, is pictured with his family. He was from what we think of as Libya today. So, and he had Berber ancestry. We know that as well. So you, the idea of race uh, as a social construct and, and whether that's what, you know, your certain measure of skin tone makes you black or makes you white or makes you brown or something like that. Um, you know, th this is where this controversy comes in a lot on, on who these people were. Um, North Africa at the time was Berber and Phoenician and Greek and Roman and, and, and all these people were, were mixed up. At the same time, Romans didn't have quite the same xenophobic or racist understandings as Kentucky. They recognized it, and, that, and that's true, um, but it's not the same thing. Um, two other examples I have on the slide is actually um, a, a Greek um, man had a slave he, he was very fond of, and he has, um, Memnon is his name, and that's his uh, bust portrait on the side, which clearly show characteristics that today we would associate with sub-Saharan or Black African style features. On the other side, we have a gravestone from Northern England outside of Newcastle, uh, in which um, the guy talks about his slave, who is from Ethiopia, that he freed and then basically, you know, all but married this man. So, and then buried him in this very elite grave with a big fancy headstone and all this stuff as well. So, I mean, he was very, he was in love with this person and he freed them. So we have a lot of this type of stuff going on as well. Uh, if you're interested, the, the portrait of Timius that's on here is called the Severin Tondo in the uh, Altes Museum in Berlin, Germany. That's one of the only color portraits we have of this emperor where it kind of shows uh, he's got a darker skin tone than his, than his wife. And so people have, have looked at that for various different reasons. Um, so, you know, the idea of these races were happening at the same time. Let me go back. 
Um, but there, there are cases of, of Ethiopian soldiers manning Hadrian's Wall. Um, and there are cases uh, of, of all these things. There's actually, outside of um, Newcastle, there is uh, the Fort of the Arabs because Arab horsemen were brought to Northern England and, and were doing the fighting and stuff. So th these are things that were happening at the time. But I don't think it actually lets me go back, but yeah, it's whatever. I can, I can talk about the conclusion and I can actually probably. So these are my, my works cited, secondary, more secondary. So lots of, lots of citations on there. And hopefully I can stop my share and we can go back to our discussion. So, um, so we, we have this woman in this elite grave and, and what does it mean? Um, she, she, if we want to use modern terms, she was a mixed ancestry. So she was, had some kind of North African ancestry and her, as far as we know, um, based upon the cranial measurements, which are controversial. Her teeth show that she was raised in a much warmer, probably Southern climate, either you know, Southern England or further down. Um, possibly Christian, possibly pagan, possibly living in this transitionary period where Christianity was still trying to find its foundation and still trying to understand what it meant to be Christian and what it meant to die as a Christian and how to, be, how to bury a person who was either Christian or pagan and how it all worked and we don't know. So uh, it's this kind of transitionary thing. But you know, it, it's clear that the Roman Empire, even in Britain at the end of the occupation, was this kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic multi place and that York in the, in the end, this northern part of Britain around 350 to 400, was doing so well that you could bury someone with all this very valuable things, um, you know, who probably had this very striking appearance and living, living in the city. So and that's kind of an analysis of this single grave. We're not sure who she was. We do know that um, at the time this was happening, a lot of Roman soldiers were using York as a retirement location once they'd done their 20 to 25 years of service, either on the wall or somewhere else. York was very attractive for them to retire in. They couldn't, a lot of them weren't allowed to get married until they had retired, so they were taking young wives. Um, you have a lot of older men taking young wives, and here's a woman who's 28, and we don't know why she died. What are the chances a woman who's otherwise healthy at 28 years old is going to die? Probably childbirth, or one of those reasons. So, you know, she would have left her, left, hopefully left her DNA somewhere in that community as well. So the, these are all open to interpretation, but this is what we're dealing with in this transitionary period of what we think of as ancient Rome and medieval. We have this woman who is far from home or is far from her grandmother's home, who, who is living here and, and living very well. And that's my presentation for today. So open for questions and discussions. 30 minutes, not bad. You mentioned uh, DNA. Um... Has an, a DNA analysis of the, the bones been done? I, it's not a DNA. They haven't done actual DNA analysis to it. There's a word in my notes that I feel like. <laughs> uh, yeah, because if they had done DNA, they could have potentially seen if there was mitochondrial to do some stuff with that. Yeah, they didn't analyze it. They, I, I don't think they found any actual DNA or if they've not done DNA analysis that I've discovered anywhere on here. Um, again, me being a historian, and not a, a scientist in that sense. So the system we use to measure the stuff is called four disk and scroll in my notes. Uh, Rose Sorry. says mineral isotopic analysis of the teeth. Yes. And there, there's what, what is the system called? Four disk, F-O-R-D-I-S-C. Thank that you. Was... I know they've used that on other things like the bog men and some of the people they found in ice in other places yeah. as well. Uh, strontium, uh, strontium isotope research. How much of the rest of her skeleton was found? Uh, not much. There, there, there are some ribcage pieces, and I think one of the arm pieces is there. Um, the, the full thing's on display. I did not include a picture of everything because every picture I found was looked like it was taken with a potato. Um, is that image that you showed us earlier, the, the cover image? Was that a reconstruction of her appearance? That is a reconstruction based on the uh, 2010 analysis of her being of North African descent. And I kind of skipped over like the other artist's interpretation of like her actual burial where they, she's wrapped up in her robe and they're putting stuff in the grave. It's kind of a cartoony image from the, the Yorkshire Museum's idea of um, doing um, like for, for kids' education. 
but as you but as you said like when it was dug up they didn't actually do the documentation process of more modern digs yeah. they were busy they were busy building georgian houses and so they kind of like they knew it was a cemetery this is the same thing that's happened in new york quite a lot um when the modern train station was built about a century ago it was built on top of a massive roman cemetery um and actually if you if you're a fan of time team which is available on youtube um they've done some great stuff in york and basically in the, the big grassy spot outside the train station where they have found the remains of a massive uh crematorium and building where they were where they were storing a lot of uh, basically like uh, sarcophagus isn't the word i can't think mausoleum um it, it, it's there that was eventually wiped out completely no one knew it was there so likely those stones were all hauled away for other things as often happens so, but I mean, they, they don't have to dig that that deep down. Everything in, in York is about six feet down. You're starting to hit Roman stuff. So, but you know, at the time, they were just plowing through with, with equipment. They knew it was there. It wasn't important to them. They dug it up. Um, the problem with stuff in York at this point in archaeology is all archaeology in York at this point is basically rescue archaeology. Um, the city has been occupied for 2,000 years. Stuff is there. The only time they get to do anything is when something is being torn down or remodeled and they actually get a chance to dig. Um, in the social room, we were talking earlier about the Orbic Viking Museum. The only reason it exists is because they were going to do a six month um, dig in the spot because they thought Viking stuff was there on the riverbank. It became so wealthy of the stuff they were founding, most of it in cesspits, it went on for five years. But then eventually they had to give it up to build the factory they were building. So, and the shopping center. Yeah, it, it, that's the way archaeology works in, in York at this point. Is it, it's like because there's everything is there. You can't ask people to move and tear down a two hundred year old building to find three thousand, you know, two thousand year old stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've been to Bath and Cambridge, and it's the same there. Yeah. So. My, well, my favorite York archaeological artifact, artifact is from the Viking period. It's the Lloyd's Bank Corporate. So, which they meet, which is fancy for saying big giant Viking turd. <laughs> so it's yay big so yeah but um yeah no that's that's our and no one's ever given her any kind of better name other than ivory bangle lady <laughs> so but i do like to explore the idea that of you know if she's buried with all of her favorite things like you know you would think we'd be buried with um the kind of presence she would have you know the, the the multiple bracelets cl clanging on her on her wrists, her earrings, her her necklace, uh, you know all these things. This 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 would be a woman of, of status, a woman of power, a woman of access to things. I think she would make a striking presence in person. How elite were these items? Like, have other ivory items been found in York? Are they super uh, rare? Kind of rare? They are, they are pretty rare at this point in time. So. Um, they, I've looked at some other ideas uh, of other ivory items were found. It's not unknown, but it is pretty rare. So it, it, I also thought um, the combination of things, the fact that she had uh, Whitby jet bracelets and ivory, ivory bracelets from, you know, to me, if this is someone who's trying to make a statement with those items, if, if this was indeed her intention, she is showing her heritage. She is showing, like, I am both of England and, and of, North Africa, no, not England because England didn't exist, but Britain. So yeah, the, the the combination of the two, I thought was like, you want to wonder if that's intentional or not. So. And do we really know why there wasn't as much written record during that time? You said that there wasn't in England in general. Is there? There's, there just isn't. So, and people have questioned this too. At the time we're looking at, at England at this time, like I said, it, it's, it's more of an occupation than a settlement. Um, a lot of the administrators were, were, were Roman or were probably brought in from outside around 350 or so. Those are, by the time you get to the end of this period, around 410, um, a lot of them worked. A lot of them were, they became hereditary positions. And you're, even up, if you're looking at the, the legions on the wall, as far north as you can go, they're there because their grandfathers were there. So, and then their grandfathers have married into local communities or, or brought wives from home and started families. And they're still called the unit of the, the fort of the Arabs. But are they anymore? We don't know. And then there's just the written record isn't there as much. You know, of written records that we have of things, it's inventories. 
So we can make our own conclusions from that, but no one is writing, you know, today this happened. The best written records we have of the, of the latest time period is the Vindalata letters, the Vindalata tablets, which were, were thrown into a pile to be burned, but because, you know, England is wet, uh, didn't work really well. And so there's these little bark letters like postcards where people were writing letters. Um, it's earlier than this period. It's, it's, it's not, I think it's the, le- the latest one is like 250, something like that. They're fantastic insights because you get a birthday invite from the wife of the centurion who's, le- who's in charge of the, the fort over in Delanda, inviting your friend from York to come to her birthday to celebrate. So you've got a, a letter from a mother in Rome who is mailing socks and underwear to her son serving up on the wall. So you've, you've got the, the commander, one of the commanders of the fort writing back to his wife um, back in Rome to send him his good shield, not the old one, the good one. And so he needs, uh, there's a lot of mention of socks and underwear, which I found hilarious because obviously like these Roman men from, from Italy are not happy in this wet, dank, cold, northern wall. So they're asking for a lot of underwear and socks. It's funny. So, but you, you get these. And as a former military member myself, I really connect with these because like my mother was sending me shit when I was deployed to Iraq. So the idea that 2000 years ago, someone is the exact same position I am was doing the same thing. is fascinating to me. I do love a tangent, by the way, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but no, there's just, there's not a lot of written record on, on, on all this stuff. And, you know, Gildas is one of the last ones. And Gildas is writing in the fifth century. So he's writing around in the 400s. Um, and when he wrote about the, the um, ruin of Britain, he's talking about the Christian communities that are still there that we thought were, were possibly gone. And he's a Christian himself. He's actually, there's two lives of Gildas. And one of them has basically have him being born in Scotland. The other one has him being born in Wales. So we, we don't know who he is, but he escapes to Northern France, to Brittany. That's where he writes, he, he founds a monastery there. And he writes about the fact that, you know, Christians are weak and Christians aren't doing their job and, and they deserve everything they get because of this reason. And, and a lot of the Anglo-Saxons, the only hope for Britain is if the Anglo-Saxons convert and, and become better Christians than the, than the Roman Christians who were there before. But he does talk about Britain as being Roman. He considers himself to be a Roman citizen. even, And he was born, as far as we know, after Rome left Britain. So what is happening on the island after Rome is that you're on your own? 409, 410, you're on your own. They're no longer having to pay Roman taxes and all this stuff. There's all this evidence about what's going on with the farming communities at the time. The fact that you know one-fifth of every crop was going over to cotton to support the wars. But they no longer have to do that. So if you're this Roman, quote unquote, administrator, and your farmland is having to spoil this, well, now you get to keep an extra fifth of stuff. So there's, there's, two, there's two different paths they usually took. One of them was keep it for themselves and, set, and try to sell it and make more money. Or two of them, they let those fields grow fallow or they change what the crops they were planting. Because Rome demanded, we need this and we need this and we need this. Well, if you're no longer having to supply someone who's making those demands, you're allowed to grow what you want. And there's evidence through archaeology and plant archaeology that people change what they were growing. And a lot of the fields went fallow. A lot of the fields shrank at the time. The community shrank because they were no longer supporting the legions and things that were going on. So I know you love York. Yes. Um, what prompted you to specifically look into this? Was it that little bit of thing and the mystery of was she Christian or what prompted you to look into this particular piece? So, yeah, so, so I love York and, and, and Britain and I'm, I'm an Anglophile. I was actually enrolled in a class on the fall of Rome. Uh, if you're looking about finding out the best stuff about what's happening at the end of the, at the, end of the empire, I will recommend this book. My problem, I think there is. Uh, Barbarian Migrations from the Roman West, so by Guy Hustle, who was actually my supervisor in York. Um, I don't like him as a person, but he's a great scholar. <laughs> I've, um, had, I've had this, professors. <laughs> so um, and he talks about basically, a lot of what he talks about the idea of ethnography and, and what is a barbarian at the time, so versus what is a Roman and, and how do those two mix. And so just narrowed my research down um, for this research paper on her, you know, I obviously tend to be drawn to, to York and, 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 and a lot. And she has an unusual grave. So um, very few of the graves we found in York, and there are a lot of them, 
are so rich in material. And the fact that the material in her grave came from so many different places, I thought, you know, le leads to a lot of interpretation you could say a lot about this woman and who she was. So I thought it was interesting to examine her. Um, and this is long after I, I used to go to the Yorkshire Museum on a weekly basis, and I've seen her in person dozens of times. And uh, now I'm kissed, now, now I wrote this paper about her. So it's, yeah, I didn't consider her at the time. So. Um, so this is really tangential, but have you read uh, Bernard Cornwell's uh, Arthurian books? I've read the first Arthurian book. Um, I, I have all the Saxon tales. I went to an open reading he did in New York and have some of my Saxon tale books signed by him. Okay, so for, for others, um, so Bernard Cornwell did a, an Arthurian trilogy like everyone does, but he's really, really a good historian. It seems to me, as I'm a literary scholar, so you know, but um, the what he has is a vision of the like the the period that Chad's talking about, and <laughs> the Roman trained generals trying to hold it together with the local irregular troops and trying to maintain civilization in the Isle of Britain as they see it and, and not be overtaken by barbarism. And they're really, really well written. Bernard Cornwell, the first one's called The Winter King. Yes, he, he writes really good books. Um, he's not overly fond of Christianity um, and makes that clear in a lot of things. And I've, in, in person, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> um, but he does do really well research, much better than the actual that, that TV show that shall not be named based on his books. So, <laughs> so, but now back to the idea of like the lack of written stuff. So even when Gildas was writing, he still talked about the, the many great cities and the uh, um, fortifications and, and stuff that was in, there in England when he left, which is great to contrast as we were talking earlier about Anglo Saxon stuff. Um, one of the Anglo Saxon poems that we can date at least to the ninth century, probably earlier, is The Ruin, which uh, most scholars have agreed is Bath, England. And they're talking about the Edgeworks, the, the, the buildings by giants, the Edgeworks, um, and how it's all crumbling stone and how they can't figure out how to do the same thing. Because at the time, the Anglo-Saxons, they built churches in stone, mostly, mostly recovered Roman stone, um, but weren't doing the same thing. Whereas Bath at the time, they could still see the ruins of this great civilization that they were living amongst at the time. So you think about that period between 500 and 900, you know, in that, that those, those centuries, what's happened to these Roman things and, and, and what's going on and, and what is it like to live amongst that at the same time. Um, London is a great example uh, where they talk about the, the idea that Rome and London was this walled city. But you know, they, there's this idea that the Saxons were afraid of the ghosts of Rome. And so they, they built their London outside those walls. And so London kind of creeped along on the outside before they went back inside. There's evidence against that, but that, that's kind of one of those fond stories that's been told in academia for a century or so. Um, but yeah, you know, you, the, 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 the concept of what is life like during the end of the Roman occupation, that, that, that's what fascinated me about this idea and why I kind of want to dig into what it was a little bit. So, because I mean, within 300 years, you get um, no, three, three, 400 years, sorry, math. Um, you've got Alcuin. Alcuin is an Anglo-Saxon scholar living in York who is so world-renowned that Charlemagne sends for him himself. And then at the time, York had the best library for teaching people. And Alcuin is part of this academic network in Britain, uh, or England at this time, if you want to call it. It's not really England yet. But, um, and he's, he sends home for a library of books. And he's part of this network of world-renowned scholars that's done so well in Britain that Charlemagne's like, I want that. And he, he calls them and a few other people to come and set up the same kind of stuff in, in his Frankian kingdom, his empire, to try to like bring education to the people, to include women. Um, Alcuin, uh, Alcuin taught Charlemagne's sons and daughters, um, rhetoric, literature, astronomy, all kinds of things. Um, we have a five minute warning. Sure. So, or we can stop now, that's up to you. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Cool. Okay, thank you very much. That was fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Yeah.